Tom Peters once said, if a window of opportunity appears, don't pull down the shade. Keep this in mind as we discuss today Turkmenistan economic opportunity in supplying China with natural gas. And what does it mean for the future of geopolitics in that part of the world? My name is Dr. David Wallalu. And my name is Dr. Ross Stewart. And you are watching Geopolitics in Conflict. Again, I just have to comment on the quality of the comments and how thought-provoking they are and how inspiring they are because of your feedback and the information that you're sharing with us that we didn't have before. Thank you and keep it coming. Yeah. Well, indeed, Ross, it's a very, very informative. <clears throat> I'm, I'm learning a lot from it as well. So, and, and we want you to know how much we appreciate that. So. That means a lot to us, and we're going to make sure uh, that we'll provide you qual uh, quality information and also as we learn from you as well. So we also take this opportunity to thank our Patreon members, uh, those who have just joined us. Uh, we thank you for your support. And for you, if you like our videos and you want to support us, consider joining the Patreon membership. So once again... Thank you very much for your support. Back to the topic, Russ. Turkmenistan, a place you've actually been. They have this golden opportunity to supply natural gas to China. They have a massive reserve of it, maybe the sixth largest amount in the entire world, and they have this opportunity. China has come knocking at the door, offering to a pipeline. Wow. What do you think of all this? Well, that's correct, Russ. That is a golden opportunity for Turkmenistan. But before we launch into this, I'll, I will provide you a, a very, very brief history about Turkmenistan without going back to... Because Turkmenistan, it's almost like a land of an, an ancient civilization. Oh, go ahead and give them the complete 5,000-year oh, tour. No. <laughs> <laughs> Which is going to take us about 10, 10 hours, hours <laughs> to do this. So. But just a brief history is it goes back to the Bronze Age which is about 5,750 B.C. So wow. that's how far. We're not going to be talking about that, of course. Uh, where we're going to at least mention is the 1991, because Turkmenistan was a part of the former Soviet Union. And when Soviet Union disintegrated, Turkmenistan got its own independence at the time. So, And uh, it was under the, the, uh, the first uh, president at the time, I think his name was uh, yeah, Supram Murat, uh, Sipa Murat Maya, Mayazov. It's kind of that's a full name. Uh, a kind of a little bit of a challenge to sp pronounce that one. Yeah, that's correct. So, so they got independence at the time in 1991, uh, and because the disintegration of the Soviet Union, Ashgabat is. I've been in Ashgabat before. It's considered the capital. What's important about Turkmenistan? Yes, besides its history and all that, it's its location. Surrounded by uh, Iran, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan and also Afghanistan. And close to Pakistan and close to Turkey. So it's, it's a wonderful location for the Belt and Road Initiative if China would care to take them uh, up on that. That's correct. And also you consider the Caspian Sea. Oh yeah. And why is that important? Because here is one thing that it's not been reported much in the West, especially from the energy aspects. And that is the uh, oil reserves in the Caspian Sea in uh, Azerbaijan and all that region, they are far greater than those in the Middle East. Which the, is just astonishing. Yeah. The only problem with that part of the world is it hard to get to. Yeah. That's where the challenge is. But, but this, uh, so this is at least uh, for where uh, 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 Turkmenistan, uh, why is, uh, has a strategic location. 
And with this opportunity of them supplying uh, gas to China, it, it's a golden opportunity. Well, you know, most of the world doesn't even know where it is. Yeah, you don't hear much about Turkmenistan, given how the system has been. It's a very, very uh, uh, reclusive system. You don't hear much about. I remember when I was there, I hardly ever seen people. Because <laughs> they are a about... A small population. Yeah, about 5.6 to 2.6 million. That's about it. Uh, but it's considered one of the largest uh, countries in Central Asia. Wow. That's what's amazing about it. But it's a rugged terrain and so forth. So, 70% well, desert. That's correct. So, But the point in all this is uh, the, the significance of this bilateral deal between China and Turkmenistan. And we're going to dig into that deeper as we move forward. Well, how do you see the deal progressing? Well, it's with the visit of the uh, delegations from Turkmenistan to China, they signed some agreements. Well, one of them has to do with the building of a third pipeline that China's going to be funding. So, and why is that important for Turkmenistan? It's also because it will allow Turkmenistan to diversify its energy. Wow. Yeah. And usually uh, China has a deep pocket, as we all know, uh, when they fund the projects, they're going to be on a larger scale, and you can just see where this is a win-win situation for both. Another win-win situation with China. Exactly. And also what we're seeing is they're diversifying their sources of energy. Well, uh, China has to do that. Uh, the reason being because the latest uh, estimate that I looked into uh, from the IEA, the International Energy Agency, suggests and estimated that China probably will need about 16 million barrels a day by the end of this decade. So and, that's, and it, that's a lot of energy. And having been in Beijing, having looked at the coal pollution, they need other sources. Uh, you know, you walk around in Beijing and in 15 minutes the nostrils are black. Because of the... Because of the coal. Yeah. And they're very rapidly replacing yeah. coal with natural gas, nuclear, that's Solar correct. And everything else they yeah. can find. Well, you know, and I had that conversation. And what you mentioned to me, I remember you saw one of the graphs where it indicates that the, uh, the, the coal... Uh, the coal is going, down. is going down. All the alternatives are going up. That's correct. This also explains why uh, recently, and we did video about it, uh, between uh, Russia and China, the nuclear... Yeah, the four uh, nuclear plants going in. Power plants, they're going to build... Uh, uh, Russia is going to build for China. And... Those particular infrastructure is for this purpose, for uh, China to get rid of its coal uh, usage altogether. It's going to take time, but it will eventually happen. Well, do you think Australia is involved in this in any way? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought this up for us, you know, because here is the, hard, here is the fact. And, and, and I don't see it any other way. So I could be wrong, but here is what I see. The way I see this deal between China and Turkmenistan is a punishment to Australia. You know, and the reason being is because uh, Australia has uh, the natural gas and has the iron ore, one of the cornerstones of the industry in, in, in Australia. Right. And given the tensions between Canberra and Beijing, as a matter of fact, Beijing has ordered three main Chinese companies that deal with energy. One of them is Sino... Uh, uh, Sinocore, yeah. something like that, to start to reduce its import of natural gas from China, from uh, Australia, rather. So you can just see where this is going, Ross. Uh, yeah, with, with Australia being left out in the cold. Uh, yes, I would say yes, because uh, my prediction will be that the next uh, uh, item will be iron ore. And there has well, been a major export to China. That's correct. And as a matter of fact, it's buoyed up their exports and kept a big portion of their economy alive. Yeah. So far, the iron ore, uh, uh, China still gets iron ore from Australia for now. We don't know how things are going to move forward, but we all see where it's going. And if China's going that direction with Turkmenistan, that, as an analyst myself, <laughs> it will give me an idea that, oh, this is what they're planning on. Because... In geopolitics, you have to think in terms of like chess moves. To China, it makes perfect geopolitical sense to go that direction. For Turkmenistan, of course, is an economic opportunity. And somebody will have to hold at the end of the stick. <laughs> and in this case, is Australia. 
There are those who have argued that no, 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 Aust you're wrong. Australia can send its uh, products to other countries. I don't agree with that. No place is as close as China. Exactly. And the markets aren't as big. Exactly. Logistically speaking, it does not make sense because the cost associated with that. But for China's move with Turkmenistan, it is as a punishment for uh, uh, Australia. It's almost using the strategy of killing the monkeys to scare the chickens. To scare the chickens. Well, <clears throat> one of the things we're seeing is that Russia is now providing a lot of natural gas to China. And do you see any conflict between uh, Turk Turkmenistan and Russia? Any conflict? No, there? no, no, it won't be. Now, if there is any problem, it will be between China and Russia, which I don't see because usually China ruffled the feathers of the Russians regarding gas. Why? It's because China has signed a 30 year deal with, uh, with, uh, with Russia as far as importing natural gas. I don't see problems emerging from that because China is not going to import its entire... They got, they got diversification that's, figured out. That's correct. Still, uh, uh, Russia provides uh, China large quantities of natural gas because Russia has a lot of it. So, and what and, is, what and is the see? reason China is doing this is because, as you mentioned, they want to diversify that. You don't want to depend on one country where you get all your sources from. Energy sources, that is. What do you see the geopolitical con uh, uh, conflicts or the interest in, in the near Middle East here? Well, th those, they can go on two, two tracks. One of them on energy, one of them on geopolitical uh, aspects of it. From the energy aspects of it is, uh, because remember, Qatar. Qatar is another country that has a lot of natural gas. And as a matter of fact, Qatar shares an oil field with Iran on the border. Oh. So it's almost like an oil field that has two straws, one from <laughs> Qatar and one from Iran. They come to an agreement regarding that. Uh, but for uh, an Iran, as we all know, as you might know, that Iran provides China with massive oil at a discounted price. Right. So, so to China, is in, uh, China is thinking in terms of, okay, how do I secure my sources of accessing energy. That is the reason why they do one what they want. If we are to advise the Chinese or any other entity in that matter, that will be the right course of action, we will suggest. Because you don't want to depend on only one country. You don't want to depend just on Iran getting all your oil. You don't want to depend just on Russia to get your natural gas. You want to diversify. And that is exactly what China is doing. That's from the energy part. Geopolitically speaking, this is almost sending a message to the West, to the United States, to the G7, to NATO, you name it, that, or to the region for that matter. Because what China is doing, basically, is sending a message to other countries like, let's say, uh, uh, India, for example. You know, and this is why we talked last time about South Korea refusing to join the Quad. Oh, yeah. It's because of this reason. Not that South Korea is scared of China. No, that's not the case. South Korea is, is thinking pragmatically because uh, uh, Moon Jae-in, the president, has to think of the welfare, the interest, the national uh, uh, interest of the country. And that is why he turned down U.S. request. What is South Korea's number one trading partner? China. China, that is correct. Oh, so, let's 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 get in. Let's get at odds with them. Yeah, that's a really smart idea. Yeah, and that is where I believe, and this is my opinion, that is where I believe Australia made the mistake. They <clears throat> did not. Uh, when I say they, I'm referring to Canberra. <clears throat> uh, Australian people might not even <clears throat> were aware of what was taking place, uh, but uh, Canberra made the mistake of not thinking this through. I'm not saying that <clears throat> there are those who argue. Well, no, Australia has to stand on its feet, stand for its values and all that. I, I concur. There, there it's is, their country. Let them do it. The, let correct. them make their own decisions. Yeah. But their, their minister, prime minister or whatever, Morrison, is not thinking in terms of the big picture as far as... I don't think so. He understands the, the scale of the, this trade between China and Australia. I rather suspect he's getting it put in his face. 
there's some very unhappy business people yeah. in Australia. Oh, they are. Because we let, they let us know via the comments that they're sending That's us. That's correct. So Very now, unhappy. Now it's going to become uh, uh, depending on the Australian people they decide for next election. But that's a separate topic for all, all, all other, other times. But. So the idea of Turkmenistan, now geopolitically speaking, China is also sending a message to the region right there. Because remember, with the ASEAN, with the APEC, the Asian Pacific uh, uh, economic uh, uh, countries and so mm -hmm. forth, the, all of them, including uh, you know, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, you name it, all those will be thinking in terms of, hey, we got our a giant neighbor that is growing economically. How can we hitch a ride on that? And this is what Indonesia ended up doing by dumping the U.S. and going with China. That's, that's the way I read it. You remember the Silk Road? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Turkmenistan was, right, was part of that? Well, what do you think they're going to do in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative? It's the perfect location for it. And I think, and this is my opinion, I think China is paving the way for more cooperation down the road. Because remember, who's bordering Turkmenistan? Iran and Afghanistan. And now with Afghanistan, is going to descend into chaos soon uh, once Taliban run over Kabul because the U.S. is going to be withdrawing from there. You can just see China is calculating. China already cut a deal with Iran. Okay? Now Turkmenistan, the next one is going to be with Taliban because the uh, Taliban is going to be making the and decision. And we suspect it's already been made. Uh, uh, you're absolutely correct, Russ. You know, w nothing uh, has come up to the... Uh, forefront yet, but I won't be surprised at all. So where Turkmenistan is going to fit into this? Yes, it's going to play a major role into the China's BRI as, as the project moves forward. What do you think the most important takeaway from this is for our viewers? Well, the question is going to become is how that's going to impact us here at home, especially when it comes down to energy prices. As you might notice, oil prices are going up a little bit. Yeah, And usually, when there are any tensions around the world, uh, prices tend to go up a little bit. So uh, how that's going to impact us? That's usually an indication for uh, how U.S. global leadership is declining. U.S. is losing uh, some sort of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, influence. It's or influence, yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah, they're losing that in certain parts of the world, and now with Turkmenistan. You know, it's almost like we're seeing a flood of these kind of events come across, come across our vision, field of vision here, and it bodes very poorly for the United States and, their, and the influence that the United States has worldwide. Well, it's because, as we always say, Ross, because the shift is already happening. It's already happening. It, so, and we're watching it occur. Yeah. Uh, the, the West and the U.S., they're having a hard time accepting that. You know, it's a reality. We, you know, we keep repeating that because it's a fact. So, right. And the challenge for the United States is, of course, uh, what we do versus what we, what we say versus what we do are two opposite things. We don't hold our end of the bargain. So, so you kind of lose credibility over time. And countries will start to think twice. And this is what I believe Indonesia did. This is what I believe South Korea did. This is what I believe other countries, Philippines, in uh, Even Malaysia. Even the Europeans. Yeah. Well, Europeans are thinking in terms of, look at just the, no matter what you hear or read about the G7, there were tensions inside that meeting uh, between, it demonstrated the clash between the U.S. and Europe regarding China. So, so to China, this is a, a, an important step in not only securing its energy, uh, the access to energy uh, markets, uh, uh, but also is influencing geopolitical to its strategic objectives. This is what the goal of China long term. So that's probably the conclusion. China is succeeding in, in uh, gathering the resources it needs to move into the future it's got planned. Yeah, that's you're absolutely correct, Ross. There is a plan, or they had a plan for all this. So they don't operate just on the whim of their minds and something we are lacking here in the U.S., unfortunately. Yeah, you never hear the Chinese say, I wish we had two parties. 
<laughs> <laughs> no, you won't hear that. No, because they just got the one. And maybe that's the problem we have. So. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other videos. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. And as always, stay informed. Till next time. Bye-bye.